somebody were to ask you at a bar, coffee shop, whatever, who you are, what would you say the answer to it is? That is a surprisingly hard answer. Um, <laughs> these days, I normally just go, well, if it's a super casual conversation and I'm not really trying to get into it, I might be like, hey, I'm a management consultant because no one really wants to know more about from a management consultant, right? <laughs> um, but um, if I really want to get into it more, I'd say, hey, um, I'm an executive coach and business coach. And I also um, have a few books out there. And so I'd spend a lot of my time advising people and writing books about it. Um, and so the easiest way to think about it is I'm a business and organization mechanic, just like a car mechanic. Your car's not working right. Mm -hmm. You pull it into a mechanic and they're like, oh, you need to fix this and that. That's what I do. All right. On, and so we start with a diagnosis, I bet, because we got to figure out what needs fixing to know so that you can actually fix the problem. So yeah. where do we start? You know, like, let's say that I'm a consulting client or you're teaching me to think about my business the way that you think about your business and your clients' businesses. Where do we start in terms of the diagnosis so we can kind of work through the solution of, of any problem that we might find? Well, typically the first thing that you tell me is the most painful is usually not the not the real thing. And so we need to find yeah. some root causes here, mm. right? And so people are like, well, I'd like to make more money because you know, you're in business. Everyone wants to make more money. I'm like, okay, well, what's keeping you from doing that? It, it turns out that Every business has what I call scale points that if you touch on them, those are what will help the business grow. And a lot of times we'll find blockages and things around that. And honestly, Kyle, um, so many entrepreneurs, once they reach, um, you know, a later stage in the business, they actually start stifling the growth of their business through their own actions and self-sabotaging and, and things like that. So usually on the entrepreneurial side, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is the founder leveraging and what could we leverage in this in this company to really help it grow or what are they doing to inadvertently block the growth of their business on the organizational side i'll typically be trying to figure out whether i've got a team with a leader problem or a leader with a team problem right and <laughs> so it's not always clear which one it is and so a lot of my work kyle is coming in and people's like well i've got this problem i'm like well we'll start there We'll really see what's going on here because there's a lot of really um, easy fixes that you can find that actually make things worse. For instance, I've had and worked with plenty of clients who came to me and they're like, well, we just want more customers. So they did the normal thing, not putting more money in marketing and advertising, except they were losing money every time they got a customer because their margins weren't sufficient and because of what they were paying in ad and marketing costs. It's like, if we just create more customers, unless you're a traditionally funded business, we are going to run out of money just by getting more customers. So we need to stop that, right? And figure out first how we make either per unit or how we actually create some profitability in what we're selling and then scale that. But don't start the other way of just going out and getting all the customers and then wondering why you actually don't have any money to grow your business. Yeah, right. So it's a bad problem to have, man. You're not making any damn money. You know, a lot of companies would look at it over a 30 year period, maybe, you know, or 18 months even, and you're not making any money up front. And then, you know, slowly over time, you build the relationship and it starts to go up a little bit. But what I'm curious about is you're talking about a problem that isn't the problem. It's the symptom of the real problem, the root cause that you're talking about. So if somebody gives you a problem, let's say not making enough money or my profit margins are too thin, how do you go about identifying the root cause of it so that you can get right to the source as opposed to trimming the, the hedges up top? Yeah, so it's really going to be dependent upon the revenue streams and the business model itself, right? And so what I will typically tell people, and they don't like this, Kyle. So listeners, if you're listening to this, you're not going to like this either. Every revenue stream that you have in your business could be considered its own business. And that actually throws a lot of entrepreneurs, especially uh, multimedia or online, or just, you know, we like to sell everything. And we don't realize, oh, you're trying to be good at speaking. You're trying to be good at advising. You're trying to be good at product sales. You're trying to be good at affiliate sales. Each one of those, you'll find out someone just does that one thing. And they do it exceptionally well. And they're your competitor. So you have to figure out how through this portfolio of activities, if you're going to continue to maintain that, you're going to do each at such a high level, or you're going to create unique value from that portfolio that you're going to outbeat the person who wakes up in the morning and thinks, I've got this one thing to grow. I've got this one effort to grow. So first of it is do a business model analysis, which 
not so much like don't go don't show me a 35 40 page business plan how do you make money right what are the actual mechanisms by which people learn about you and give you money and that money turns into different value and services for them and at the end turns into income for you and by the time i know that's like okay that's basically the think about it as like the physics of this business i know what i'm dealing with here right and then once I know the physics or once I know what that looks like, then I can say, okay, here's where it's wobbly or here's what we can press on or, oh, like the reason that your, you know, lead flow is so bad is because you've done the normal thing where you've built it and just hope people will come. That doesn't work, right? We got to invert that. Or the reason why it seems like no matter how many clients or customers you bring on, you still don't have enough is tied to your profitability. So we need to go fix that and figure out what's going on and what are the specific things. Do we need to raise your rates? Do we need to lower your unit cost? Do we need to like change the, you know, models of, for instance, um, especially in service-based businesses, some people are like, okay, well, you can give me a quarter to get the project started and then the quarter and they kind of do that along the way and then wonder why they can't get ahead on any other things. Well, turns out clients be clients and they're always going to like, they're usually going to have delays in their service and things like that. And so if your payment is tied to that, you basically are always at the point to where you're putting to excess labor up front. And normally in these businesses, you're paying somebody before the client pays you. So if you're in that situation, you're always going to be really strapped for cash, right? And so sometimes it's just not changing the rates, not changing their service, not changing anything. It's just changing the way that they get paid can create that additional boost and make it work. Or another example is um, if you have a product-based business and you've got, say, a subscription model, you've got something where you're used to giving people a 30-day trial. That's actually a really hard business model because you have to float all of the cost of your business for 30 days at least before you get paid for it. Sometimes it's just either cutting that to a two-week window or maybe making a per-purchase model that puts cash up front that allows you to use that cash to grow your business. And again, a lot of this um, may not be what you'll normally read on sort of the standard get your business started things, but once you get going long enough, these are the things that create those stagnations and plateaus in businesses that we just have to go and say, okay, it's a matter of cash or it's a matter of where we're putting value or it's a matter of allocation of resources or time, energy, and effort. Right. And yeah, so what you're talking about is there are kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can optimize and, and systematize for increased profits moving forward. But there, at the end of the day, Jay Abraham talks about there's three ways of growing a business. You can get more clients, you can increase the, the prices, and you can um, increase the frequency in which they purchase. And so there's actually having... four. There's the fourth one would be um, get more product or sales from per each transaction. So it's the, the cross sale, upsell, like, right. like fries with that. That's the same sort of thing. So you can increase the price per unit. Yeah. You can increase the frequency of transactions, or you can also increase the amount of profit per individual transaction via upsells, cross sales and things like that. But yes, same basic points. Right. And it's still three at the end of the day. You just added the extra, the price addition to the the increasing per sale by adding upsells, downsells, whatever. So these are the ways that you can op you can look at these three points in your business and try to find which one you can optimize. But the question becomes, how do you know which one? Like, let's say you're objectively looking at a business. How do you know which one to start with? How do you know which one to optimize, how to start testing with, for example? I'm going to give you an unsatisfying answer here. This is going to be very unique to the business. Like I can't give a one size fits all answer yeah. to this. Otherwise we would all be pressing that one size fits all button. Right. Right. And but what, so I'm, I, what I'm wondering is how you think about it. How do you know which one to start with? Let's say if you're looking at a consulting client's company, what's your thought process going into it to identify which one would be the best to optimize first? It's always the constraint like find mm. the constraint in the business. Mm. And when you find that, that's what you know how to move around, right? So um, if it's that they can only make a thousand units of stuff a month mm. and they can't change that in their current manufacturing, that's going to be a unique constraint, right? If it is they're selling the founder's time, that's the constraint. 
if it's you know on the amount of time it takes to ship from overseas that's the constraint so there's always multiple constraints hmm. but it's the one that is the most that that is the most determinant on the sort of speed and growth of the business right yeah um and so this is where when people talk about you know um target markets or tans or things like that what they're trying to show is there's a constraint there's a ceiling to this market right that we can't grow past and and you know past that point you reach saturation but most businesses never actually get to Tim anyways. Like that's a, sort of a moot point, right? That tells you how big the potential customer pool is. But most of the time it doesn't matter, right? It's really how quickly can you acquire that? And I say most of the time, if you're going for traditionally funded businesses where you really need to be thinking, how does this become a billion dollar business? You need to worry about that. That's like 0.5% of businesses. Most of us are not in that style. Right. Most of us need to figure out how are we going to make 100K? How are we going to make three to 400K? How are we going to make a mil? How are we going to make five mil? Those are different sort of things. And Tam is never the governor for that. So it's what's that constraint? And mm -hmm. it's really asking a lot of questions. So it's like I was talking to a client by email today. It's like, okay, so is this because um, she wanted to grow a business? Um, actually, as a prospect. So she wanted to grow a business. And I was like, well, what does growth mean? Let's start there. Because that's not an obvious answer, right? Love it. Um, it's like, do you want to grow your revenue? Do you want to grow your profit? Do you want to grow your level of impact? Do you want to grow your team? There's so many different places. Do you want to grow your social media following for different reasons? What does growth mean? Okay. Now that we have that, she's like, well, you know, I want more client or I want more service revenue from clients. And to your point, there's like three ways of doing that. But for her, what we've been trying to figure out is, okay, are you at your deal flow rate? Are you at your book rate that like we actually can't increase that because you got a service-based team, there's a scale to that. So we can't just go out and throw 3X, you know, more clients at that and solve that problem. It's actually going to break the business in a different way. So for her, it's like, okay, are we trying to change it so you get more of your right fit, higher paying clients over the next few quarters? That's a different question than get more clients, right? And you build differently from that. So for me, it's usually what's the chief constraint of the business? What's the thing that um, we could subtract that's the lead weight from the business, right? And sort of the anchor and keeping things from going. Um, the third one is they're really looking at, at growth and scale. It's like, well, how do we... 3x or 10x the value that we can deliver from you from this business and it might not be in a linear sort of fashion where it's to sell more time or sell more product um those are my three sort of go-tos but the what's the constraint is always always the thing because it doesn't matter what we build around it that's always going to govern it and so until we solve that and figure out why it's the constraint we're going to hit that plateau we're just going to hit it in a different degree of time it might be three months it might be six months it might be a year but we're going to hit it. So let's at least know about it. And sometimes we decide we want to keep that constraint, hmm. right? Sometimes if it's a small business, a micro business, micropreneur team, and it's just the founder, and they're like, I actually just want to be a solo. Okay. That determines a lot of things. That one choice has a ripple effect on a lot of other things. Or we can say, you know what? We are only going to work with 10 clients per year. That's right, which the gives you the Rolex effect because you can't go to a Rolex dealership and buy. So they kept the constraint as, as a positive. They leaned right into it. Same as, as Yeezys or whatever, you know, these um, Richard Mill watches, you, you think things you can't buy. And that gives it a, a prestige that makes it skyrocket in terms of perceived value on the aftermarket. And so what these companies are doing, it's interesting. Instead of eliminating the bottleneck, they constrained it even more and then leaned into it as the benefit that it could be perceived as, which is fascinating. You're taking the positive of what could be perceived a negative and making it the most, the biggest positive you got in your business in terms of revenue generation, which- Absolutely. I mean, a I lot of artists that. do that too, right? Yeah. Like How Beyonce so? is not trying to replace herself, right? She's not trying to do that. Like she is trying to take, like use the constraint of her talent and her being like the show and amplifying that. And that is the constraint right. of that business, Taylor, so on and so forth. And they're doing pretty well, right? Yeah. Um, and so- Every business has constraints. You're just trying to figure out which ones you want to keep and which ones you want to change. If you're in a low price sort of Walmart market, right, your constraint 
has to be like how low your price is. Like you have to win on price, right? And so that becomes a constraint that you work around. I mean, you you go all the way in because, um, and I'm, I'm parroting Seth Godin here, is, you know, um, when you do the race to the bottom, you know, the worst thing is being in second place, right? Because the first place winner is getting all of the actual benefit of that. You're yeah. just charging long prices and not winning. Right. Yeah. And so it's not a game you really want to play unless you really go all in. If you really want to do that and you want to move the most amount of widgets, that is a very unique strategy that you cannot half-ass and win. Um, and the same is true on the other side. If you are the Rolex of your market, you can't half-ass that, right? You have to go all in and you have to win. If you're Tony Robbins, you have to be Tony Robbins all the way, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or Beyonce or Taylor or whoever we want to list that is really the, at that top end of the earning of any market. And so that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you choose, that's the constraint. We are going to build around that constraint and not try to touch that constraint. Um, and it's kind of like on the organizational side, sometimes the mistake that people will make is that they'll have a 10x player on their team and, tr and then bog that 10x player down so that they become a 1x or half x player, right? If that's the case, no, you actually do everything you can to let that 10x player run. Like they still have to be a decent human, right? They can't be an asshole just because they're really good at what they do, right? But you don't try necessarily to pull everybody up to that unicorn. You figure out how to best play with that unicorn on the field. Mm. What about, because the way you're spitting is fascinating. You're, you're talking some some fascinating knowledge that you can imp, imp, implement in all kinds of businesses, whether, whether it be the team, the marketing angle that you lean into the, in leveraging the negative as the positive is, is interesting stuff. What about the the typical problem that you would find that a client that you have is an easy fix, something that would generally be like, for example, prices are too low, you know? And so there's an easy fix as a consultant to just double the prices and more often than not, it tends to work. What about these patterns that you've noticed and things that, that most business owners are doing subpar and then you can step in and, and easily be able to, to turn up the scales in terms of profitability? Yeah, most micros and small businesses are undercharging. So that's why it's such an easy go-to, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because um, what, what a lot of times happens, you're like, well, I'm going to scan the marketplace and see what the common price is and then charge that. Except for when you do that, you got to look at the bell curve. You've got all the people who are confident enough about the value that they provide, and that's pulling it up this way. But you have far more people who are insecure about their rates or who have a subsidized business or all sorts of different ways that businesses are subsidized or they're trialing their rates. And that's in that number too. And so when you set your rates based upon the average market rate, you're basically setting your rate against other people's insecurities. Interesting. Right. Mm. And so and your that own. automatic yeah. yeah. And that automatically is going to do it. So one of the first things we do is depending upon the business model and what they're actually promising is try to move them up into the premium range. Mm. Right. Not necessarily the Beyonce Taylor Rolex range. And that's that's a different fight. But at least to get them out of that average so that they can compensate for that. Because I mean, if you sit, if you know a few things, um, no entrepreneur is, is um, not aware that um, a lot of small businesses fail. It's just a known thing. So if you do the common thing that everybody do, and there's something like an 80% failure rate, you're more likely going to fail, right? That's what the trends would dictate. I know it's an oversimplification, but it actually turns out to be truthy enough for our model here, right? And so just setting your rates where most people are setting their rates starts to put you closer into those trends that we just talked about, right? So just getting out of that can go a long mm -hmm. ways. I mean, there are a few reasons that, that businesses like entrepreneurs and small business owners quit, but two of them is they run out of cash, just straight cash, right? Two, they run out of energy. Those two are really interchangeable, it turns out, right? If you've got a lot of cash, you have a lot of different options. Cash solves a lot of problems, right? For a limited amount of time, energy can solve a lot of problems. But that doesn't last nearly as long, right? We've all seen those entrepreneurs that started and they're really gung-ho for like that first six months or maybe 18 months. I know, where are you three to four or five years in? Right. Um, because that's going to determine the longevity of your business. And that's usually where I come in for a lot of people anyways. Right. Um, and so 
energy runs out. Cash gets you a lot of different things. Turns out purpose can turn into energy and cash too, but that's maybe a different conversation. So, hmm. you know, that's one of the, like raising your rates is one to go to, right? I'm always for small businesses and micro businesses, really cash focused, not necessarily going all the way to profit first, nothing wrong with the system. Love what Mike has done there, but um, debt will catch up with you. Under earning will catch up with you. Cash gives you options, right? So that's one of the first things when I'm looking at their financials and I'm one of the I, I thought most business coaches do this, but apparently it's not true. It's like, I will actually go through financials with my clients. Here's how you reach your P&L statement. Here's how you look at some of this. Like, here's really what's going on in your business. This is what your business is telling you. Let's pay attention. Hmm. Before we just wheelie nearly start throwing money at problems, right? You, that's how you end up creating more problems. So raise rates, focus on cash. When they meet me, most people I'm having to tell to focus and simplify their business model because they've made it too complex and they're the only person that can actually grow it because they are the only person that can see all the parts and do all the things. So we're usually coming in and saying, okay, which of these revenue streams, which of these offers, which of these things is actually the Pareto principle that if we push on it, if we really focus on that, we'll get the business to grow. And depending upon the client, a lot of times that's, that can take a while for clients to let go of things that are like, okay or that they really want to work but really aren't working or will never be great right because the sunk cost fallacy and, and different things like that we're all human right but to come in and say hey this thing that you've been spending the last two years on that you probably sunk you know a good 50 75 thousand dollars of either your cash or time into we need to let that go um it's it's never going to beat this other thing because Kyle, the reality is hard one for us to really sink into from a strategic perspective. We want the next thing we do to be at least as good as the last thing that we did or what we're currently doing. Otherwise, we should keep doing what we're doing and do that a little bit better. So the new thing needs to be better than the old thing or the current thing. Um, most small businesses, most micropreneurs only have so much room for new things because they're so chewed up mm. by the old and current things. And so mm. clearing up those lead weight or those, those dead weights, clearing up those things that are okay, but never really going to be great either gives us more focus so that we can do something new and better, or we can take the best of what we're doing and apply those gains to that. Yeah. What comes to mind when you say that is when Steve Jobs went back to Apple in like, I don't know, late nineties, 2000, somewhere around there. And the first thing he did was cleared out the stores. And the result is the modern day Apple store, you know, and it's beautiful and it works well. And so he got rid of everything that was non, non premium selling, you know, everything that was kind of there, that would sell a little bit, cost a shit ton to develop, but then wasn't a home run so got rid of it all and then focused on the actual money makers which is hard to do man especially if you've invested a lot of time and money into the other ones to really swallow that pill and say all right made a mistake let's focus on what's working and especially as entrepreneurs it's easy to chase the shiny object and, and try something new as opposed to leaning into what's already working and finding ways to to improve that and finding the shiny object within what's already working as opposed to searching elsewhere for it, which I think there is some wisdom there if you can lean into that. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating. But one of the things that you said, dude, is the purpose leads to, and, and reiterate for me, you said the purpose leads to vision. Purpose can lead to clarity, energy. Which leads to pro oh, energy, okay, which leads to profit. Yeah. Walk me through which that can, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, Because, you know, there's a direct energy transition between purpose, which is vision in the mind, to the transmutation, as Napoleon Hill would say, into the concrete, into reality. Walk me through how you visualize that process, so to speak. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And I want to let you know that I've got a free book that you can get if you want to tap into more of these resources. And you can get that for free at kylesbook.com. Back to the podcast. Yeah, so... There is, I'll, I'll just be frank here. There's a lot of attrition and survivorship bias that happens in the entrepreneurial space, right? Um, we look at the winners and try to do what they do without realizing that there are so many people who did not win, who failed and did that same mm -hmm. thing, 
Right. And so um, it's one of those things to where you have to, from a purpose perspective, figure out, okay, um, I'll also use, you know, um, Jane P. Carson's finite and infinite game here, right? So a finite game is a game that you play to win. So that's a lot of the games that we play, you know, across the United States, across the world, actually. An infinite game is a game that you play to play, mm. right? Mm. infinite game is a game that you play to play and a lot of times when you're playing an infinite game you're trying to figure out what are the sub finite games that allow me to keep yes. playing this game <laughs> yes yes right and so so many people start their entrepreneurial journey with only the finite game in mind i want to make money <laughs> right i want to not have a butthole mm -hmm. boss anymore i want to get out of this commute so and so forth they're just playing these really finite games and that can work for a while but there's for many people, not that hard to beat, right? Unless you're coming out of a really high paying, great job, you can replace your job pretty quickly doing a whole range of different things, right? I've been doing this Kyle for since 2007 or so. So I realize I'm sort of hand waving how difficult it can be such, such that you're like paying your own income you're paying your own living or paying for yourself from your business, but it's really possible. It's not as hard as you think, right? Over time. But what happens when you reach that point of diminishing returns for your dollar? What happens when you don't have the commute? What happens when you're the butthole boss, right? The game change. You have to figure out a way to recommit to this thing for a long call and find those kernels that are going to um, really keep you in the game. And so there's this real weird trick that we do. Like my thing is that as an entrepreneur, you want to take the thing that you're best at, that you're the most natus and genius at, and that's what you should be charging the most for. People do the opposite, right? They look at what's hard for them to do, uh, and then yeah. they charge more for that. Yeah. So every time they try to grow their business, every time they try to do that, they go to the hardest thing that it is for them to do, and then usually get more of that, but it's the hardest thing for them to do that they want to do least, Right. When you invert it, you can say, wait a second, like every every entrepreneur listening to this, find that thing, each of us have it, that like when you get paid to do it, you kind of feel like you cheated somebody. Like they're going to yeah. find out yeah. how much you actually love this thing. And so if they find out, like there's, there's doomsday scenarios that happen from that. That is closely tied to your infinite game and your purpose. I want you to go there and stay there and build from that. Don't do the thing to where you're like, oh, I love to do it. So if they pay me anything, it's bonus. No, don't do that, please. <laughs> right. Because what you're going to do is massively under earn the thing, uh, under earn on the thing that you're going to be the best at. And then put all the ways of making money on the hardest thing that you don't yeah. want to do. Hmm. So when you do that, you either are on the grind mode or what you do is because you sold this thing that you don't want to do, you'll go hire people to do that thing which tanks your profit, tanks your cash, so on, so front, so forth. And so that purpose, finding that infinite game, finding that thing that you can get up in the morning for and say, you know what, no matter the outcome of this day, this week or this month, I'm still going to be doing this, right? Yeah, this is man. the thing. That is what can fuel a decades long mm. business and decades long career. Just making money, just making that next sort of, you know, zero or whatever that might be for you. It's not going to last that long. Especially in terms of fulfillment. You find that out once you start making some money that you're like, wait a minute, this is what I was waiting for all that time, man. What the fuck? I, I thought it was, you know, I identified as as the money. I am a millionaire, quote unquote. It's like what I wrote in my journal for like 10 years or something, you know? And then it turns out it's like, wait a minute, not nearly as fulfilling as I thought it was over there. And so you really need to have that infinite game that you lean into. The image that comes to mind is... Uh, you can say like the other side of the coin, right? That that classic expression. So I've got a, uh, let's picture it as a, a big circle floating in space, black on the top, white on the bottom. That is the universe, the game that we're playing, the, the yin and yang, if you will, right? And then within that are micro circles. Um, so the big coin, quote unquote, one way of visualizing this. Then there are micro circles, micro coins within it, each containing black and white, positive and negative. And then you can look at those as games. And then you're saying to focus on the big circle and then play the little circles within, focusing on the actual experience 
experience of it as opposed to the result. And then that's how you can get the long-term fulfillment as opposed to playing the little games and then finding out that there's not much oomph to them at the end of the day. You know, it's, yeah. it's something very powerful to that. In the Bhagavad Gita, they talk about that, how there is the, the purpose of working for the experience itself as opposed to the goal. And one is fulfilling, the other isn't. And so there's an interesting balance you have to strike there. But tell me this, how do you balance that with having a goal, which is a result that you're aiming for without forcing it? So, you know, you've got Wu Wei, whatever you want to call it. You, you force the result. Oftentimes you push it away inadvertently. How do you balance having a goal with focusing on the experience of it and not attaching to that goal too much? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I love all the references here. I didn't go hard philosophy mode today because I didn't really want, like, I didn't know how much time we had. But yeah, way, 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 which is doing, not doing, um, translated from Tao Te Ching. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. So many of our spiritual traditions actually point to these things. And so, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for two and a half, three, three K years or three K grand years. So since Plato and before, right? Um, the hardest question I think here. So I, I will often tell clients this, the hardest question I'm going to ask you is what do you really want? Not what do you want? What do you really, really want? What are you willing to create an organizing principle for your life around? Mm. And if you don't know that, a lot of times we're just going to spin on a bunch of different projects and methods and tactics. You should try this. You should try LinkedIn, blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Yeah. We're just going to bounce around all the different things that you can do without having that super strong North Star. Hmm. Right. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that there's one, one universal North star for all of us. Right. At least I can say something like thriving or flourishing. Sure. But what that means is going to be very individual to each pe to each person. Right. What I typically look at to answer your question is that that goal, it's mainly just a experiment that allows you to focus your energy. Okay. You don't know if you achieve that goal, if you're actually going to be happy, if you're going to be better off, if you're going to be worse, so on and so forth. Those are just things that we have to put into the void of things we can't know. And we can say, this is our best guess of something that would you know, like make my life better. And so for every project, you know, as an entrepreneur or as even with my executive coaching clients, I'm always asking, how does this project, initiative, objective, really help you live the type of life you most want to live. Hmm. And if it's just going to be cashed out in dollars, well, it's going to help me make money. It's like, okay, pause. What are you going to do with that? Um, what's underneath that? Because a few things happen on the entrepreneurial side of things. You start and you spend a lot of energy trying to get your thing going. And that sort of all in hustle mode, you know, no boundaries sort of scenario sets your baseline for what working should feel like. That creates your normal. And so many entrepreneurs spend so much of their career either trying to maintain that normal, looking back to when they had that normal and they don't have it anymore. Mm. Right. Trying to stay in that zone. And it was never normal to start with. It was a phase and a season. Yeah. You were overworking then, it was unsustainable, and that's okay. That's what it took then, but that switch never turns off. Hmm. Um, and so we do the next project, we get the next goal, we do the next project, we get the next trophy, we do the next thing, right? All at that level of hustle, all at that level of all in. You know, it depends on how long you play this game. You look at it, you know, five to 15 years later, and you're like, I'm done. I am so, so done with this. Um, but there was another option the whole time. Right. Yes, it's always going to take some additional, you know, plowing energy, like when you're making the fields for farming, like it's hard to plow. It's hard to get the ground ready, but it doesn't mean mm -hmm. you exert that same level of energy throughout the whole endeavor. You can pause and say, OK, that was it. That was that season. I'm going to transition into this new season to where I'm going to experiment differently instead of saying, I can I get that goal? can I get that goal while still being in integrity with my personal values? Hmm. Can I get that goal without picking up the, you know, 30, 35 pound desk pounds from becoming a sedentary worker for so many different people. 
can you do those? And you start putting in some constraints that actually are relevant to the type of life you want to live. Can I do that while having kids and being a stay-at-home mom? Right? Those are important constraints that enough people don't bake in and sort of use to modify some of those goals because those constraints start to become part of the purpose and part of the values that you're injecting into the system, right? That's how you get to the infinite game. It's never about hmm. really growing the business, right? It's about doing something meaningful that provides value to people while you're able to live your life alongside it. Right. It's one thing it goes back to the, the coin analogy. It's if you look at it, pure consciousness, observing the coin, this is, is one thing that you're looking at. Right. And so when you realize that it's one life that you're living in, so you can compartmentalize it if you wanted to into micro games within the one thing. And then but you still have to realize that it's this one life that you're that you're looking at there and then how it affects all of the lives, which is the 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 big coin, the uh, the uh, meta game, um, and then there's the the consciousness that we all share that observes and and participates um, at the egoic level. Which is you know we can get all kinds of of woo woo and, and philosophy. You know there's all kinds of philosophy we can integrate into that, but I, I'm it's still it's difficult to comprehend. And, and I'll go back to this because I'm I'm not quite clear on how to still have the goal but not with not, but not attached to it you go with you, you go with the flow you, you visualize it you you picture that you really plow the field so to speak get that infinite game in vision and then make sure that every move that you make is contributing to that while still focusing on the moves themselves as opposed to trying to force the acquisition of that uh, the the plowed field that you had created to begin with. How do you, how do you yeah. do that? You know, what's your process for that? How do you view the whole situation? What's your favorite dessert, Kyle? Um, let's say pumpkin pie. How about that? <laughs> pumpkin pie. Um, have you ever eaten so much pumpkin pie that you've actually made yourself sick and uncomfortable yes. and miserable from it? Yes, definitely. Okay. So you had a goal in mind when you started that process and you weren't paying attention along the ways until when it reached that point and you decided mm. to go past the point in which it was a pleasurable, fulfilling experience to a point where you take this thing that you love that you really most of the time want and have corrupted it. Yeah, definitely. Very similar, very similar, you know, way of saying as you, you we steer, especially in the West, we steer by our head so, so much. Mm. We get caught into scenarios and strategies and ideas and things like that, right? And expectations and commitments and things like that. And that's where so much of our suffering comes from. Um, and sometimes, like, it can be as simple as noticing that that goal, which was the pumpkin pie, you thought you wanted, right? You You wanted a certain amount of it. And there's a certain amount in which, like, you got it. You were on the path, but when you stop enjoying it, switch. When it stops being fulfilling and purposeful for you, mm. switch. Um, what happens is, especially as we age, there's a critical period. A lot of people know it around 28 is where in modern society um, in the West, we say a person's identity is fully formed. Not 22, 28. There are so many decisions that a lot of folks make in their late 20s and 30s that are based off of something they wanted when they were 22 or 25. And they've been, been spending the, the next couple of decades playing that out. It can be a degree, it can be a business, it can be a certain type of relationship, it can be an object, it can be whatever it is. And a lot of times what I will ask clients and ask people is, is this thing that you're chasing relevant to the season of life that you're in? Mm. How, is it going to make you, I say happy as a shorthand, but how is that going to be deeply meaningful for you? Why is this worth the limited amount of projects that you have remaining in your life? Right? So it turns out it takes most people three to five years to complete a significant project in their life. And we can only do so many of those. Take your age, subtract it from 85, divide it by five. 
that's the number of those really thick, juicy projects that you have remaining. If you spend a long time chasing something that your yesteryear wanted or something that your parents want or something that somebody else wants, yeah, you know, you've wasted or you've spent, you know, one of those big project slots doing that. And so as much as my work is about finishing what you start and seeing things through, there's also this other side of the coin that you keep alluding to, Kyle. Like you can get to the top of that mountain and say, you know what? I think I'm done here. I, I don't want to continue to walk through this valley anymore. I saw what I needed to see and it's no longer that important to me anymore. Hmm. And it's probably going to be letting go of a lot of stuff, either physical stuff, but also parts of your identity, right? Because that's what these big significant projects shift, right? You are literally a different person than you were before, but that's the beauty of it. If you embrace it because yeah. you are a different person, you're not, like obligated to want and like the same things you can change. Now we don't want people to like willy nilly, just be exiting marriages and business contracts and things like that. I'm not talking about that. Although if that's what you need to do, seems like you have some conversations in hands, right? But I don't think enough people really give themselves the opportunity to say, you know what? I have changed. This version of me is not oriented in the same way as that version of me. I played enough of those finite games to know that to continue to do that gets me off of my infinite game. So I need to switch. Hmm. I need to change it up. Um, we only have this one life to live that we know of. Right. And so, yeah. you know, I want us to really be thinking like this thing that I'm doing today, how does it stack and add up to something three to five years from now is actually going to matter to me. And if it doesn't, Maybe let it go because there's also other things you can put into this day, week, and month that might matter a whole lot more. Life's pretty short. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. <laughs> the old Ferris Bueller quote, man. But there is some truth to that. I mean, very deeply so. Because you're talking about you set up the micro games, but sometimes it's it's easy to lose track of the real thing that you are aiming for or not even have, have conceptualized it to begin with. Because like you said, you're basing the games you're playing now off of what your previous self deemed worthy of you to play, which is fascinating. You think that I don't think the identity is solidified by the time you're 28. I mean, it goes to exactly what you were saying. You you change as you go throughout the the process. You're, right? you you're sort of an adult macro construct construct of your identity changes. That's when you actually can start to tell the difference between what you want versus what your parents want. Ah, right. Mm, interesting. And so you, you you start to gel in that way, whereas earlier than that, you're usually playing off other people's scripts. Right. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can I can live to, I can live with that. Yeah. You know, it comes down to the fact that a lot of people don't have the true north, the the, the plowed field to aim for to begin with, you know? And so how would you de describe the process of discovering that optimally? How do you go about plowing the field to see what the, the north star is that you were to, like if you're in a cornfield, there's tall corn above you, you can't see the sky. So you plow the field to see the North star, but how do you go about plowing the field? And then how do you know that you found the North star? Um, I'll go back to ice cream or I'll go back to your um, okay. pumpkin pie, right? Okay. You try different things. And I know that sounds really simple, but that's really what it is. Do you yeah. enjoy both the process and the outcome? That would become the question. If you enjoy plowing, like you really, really love plowing, and you really, really love all the things entailing, you're probably closer to what your North Star is, right? Um, you want to find those games where you love both the process. Well, if you play outcome-focused games and you orient your life around that, then you're going to be at a certain point just playing on hard mode, right? You'll reach this in-between stage to where it's like, oh, I like the process as much as the outcome, and that's cool. But really what we're looking at is what are the things where the outcome becomes a bonus for you getting to do the thing? A bonus. Yeah. That's the way right? look at it. Mm. And so it's like, okay, what are these things that like, like I go back to what I was saying about charging, right? Charging for those things that it's the, like getting paid for it is the bonus, right? Mm -hmm. We know from a strategic perspective, we need to charge more, but that's because we're playing that finite game of money and paying mortgages and things like that, right? Um but I don't think enough people are oriented to be like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing that I enjoy 
and I'm going to do it because I enjoy it and that's enough. Right. Um, so many, um, folks, I'm, I'm currently 44. So to, to, to put my age out there, um, I look at the generations under me and I'm like, y'all are trying to like dollarize all of your hobbies. You're trying to dollarize everything that you enjoy. And I understand it's hard out there, but at the same time, when you do that for everything, you lose the pure joy of the thing because mm -hmm. then you start trying to say like, oh, well, I can do X, but X is only going to earn what? Not earn this. Or I can do Y and that's going to earn this. Well, I need the money, so I'm going to do Y. <laughs> or those types of things versus saying, what do you actually enjoy? And is it sufficient for you to just enjoy it? Mm. Right? Well, we got to make money at the end of the day. I, it kinda, it, and I see what you're saying because it corrupts it, right? If you do the thing that you love, like Dan Sullivan calls it your um, unique ability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you do the thing that you love, but then there is also the, the necessity to monetize something. And if you look at it for the money, it taints it. But if you look at it for the experience of loving it, but yet find a strategic way to monetize it, that is sort of the balance that you're trying to get at, right? It strikes the, the two monetization without the corruption. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. that's true for one thing. Most of us have multiple things right? Multiple creative endeavors, multiple talents, multiple things like that. So sure, you need to find it in one area of your life. Like this is not Star Trek. Universal basic income does not exist yet. We do need to work for a living, right? I get that. But I think the more that we really center into enoughness and say, you know what, mm. I have enough coming from that. I'm willing to do my version of a job for that thing. But I also am unwilling to make my entire life either doing that thing or doing other things for the same reason I'm doing that thing. That's where you can start to find some balance. So to be more specific, sure, monetize a skill, a passion, do that kind of whatnot. Figure out what your enough point is. For the other things in your life that truly matter to you, maybe you don't, you know? Uh, maybe we use those old fashioned words like hobby where you can just do it because you enjoy it and you don't need to gram it. You don't need to get followers behind it. You don't need to show the world about it. You can just enjoy it for you. Hmm. Um, and that way you get the best of both worlds. You get this thing that's your unique ability that you can have that autonomy, mastery and purpose around that you can say, I do that thing kind of where you started, right? When people ask, it's a complicated question when people ask me that um, I can say, Hey, I do these things. And I also have a life outside of that that's completely different. That's sometimes sometimes tied to it, sometimes not, right? Um, because I am a motorcycle rider as much as I am an executive coach, right? That's what I'm looking forward to doing after this, after some of the other work that I'm doing. I'm going to be doing that. Or I'm a hiker. I'm all sorts of different other things. And I think what we've learned throughout COVID I don't know, we're still talking about COVID, is um, it's important for us to have multiple anchors of value in our life. Because if any one or two of those get taken away, we can go into some of those other things that are valuable and meaningful. But if you're over-indexed on work and your job gets taken away or your business doesn't work or whatever your thing is, then you're going to have a harder play, harder time finding meaning and happiness and joy outside of that. And so not saying don't monetize any of your unique abilities, just maybe figure out what your enough point is and figure out what are the places in my life? What are the other infinite games I want to play here that truly, truly matter to me and use those as a constraint, as a helpful constraint about what you're going to do inside of your business. Hmm. What was the book that you mentioned, Finite versus Infinite Games? Who was that by? Yeah, by James P. Cars. Um, and so Simon Sinek wrote a more popular book, or he popularized the concept. Um, I think it's called The Infinite Game. I read James P. Carson, so that's where I know I know that from. Um, and Autonomy, Mastery, and Purpose actually is a reference to Dan Pink's work um, in a, from a book called Drive, which are the motivators um, for or which are the basic human motivators that we should spend more of our time um, orienting um, our life around. 
Yeah, it's this, this self-actualization, the top of the pyramid, as Maslow talked about, instead of the the remaining five or so underneath of it, right? Which uh, <laughs> you only get to once you have the money to realize that you it's, that it's not as fulfilling as you thought it would be when you were at the lower levels. You know, same as you're hungry, you'd kill for some pumpkin pie, but then once you eat too much pumpkin pie and all right, it's time to move up the ladder a little bit. The the interesting part is when you get to the top and you realize there's infinite potential in terms of what you you hit your star to, so to speak. And so there's there's something to that. I love it, man. Deep conversation. What's a conversation that we should be having that we're not? You know, what's a question that uh, if I were to ask would be able to provide a lot of value for an entrepreneur watching or listening, but I'm not asking it. But if I were to ask it, would uh, help us out. What's the thing you want to do after this business is successful? Mm, I love that question. Mm. Um. And it, it unpacks a lot, right? It gets to some of the things that we're going to, that, that we talked about there, but I don't know that enough people are saying after, right? Mm -hmm. Cause especially if you're younger, you're like, I want to do this forever. Um, you might want to do parts of it parts for of the it. rest of your life, yeah. right? But you won't want to do the whole thing. And what is it providing for you? Right? Yes. Creative joy. Yes. You know, a fuel for ambition. Yes. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But what about after that? what's next for you, so on and so forth. And you don't have to know the answer, right? It's more of the prompt of what would be after that. Mm -hmm. What would um, what would be something that I would align, again, like I said, three to five years of my life in an experimental sort of way of saying, do I enjoy this? Do I want to continue to do this? Mm -hmm. um, do I want to remain open and curious about this? Because it turns out, and uh, my good friend Todd Cashton, Oh, how did he phrase this? I want to be careful because he's, he's really specific about this. Um, one of the biggest indicators of someone's happiness is their curiosity. Right. And so living your life in this very experimental way of saying, I'm, I've got this, I've got this goal. I've got this hill that I want to climb. I think I'm going to like it. I think it's going to be worth doing, but it might be wrong. And I'm going to figure it out. It's, it's a FAFO moment. I'm going to fuck around and find out. But if it's not, I'm going to say, you know what? Nope, that sucked. I'm not doing that. I know that about myself and I have the ability to change, which means you're going to fail, right? You're going to do some things and it's not going to work out for all sorts of different ways. It's not aligned. Um, you're going to do some things and you're going to fail one success at a time, right? Um, because you're going to be playing the um, sort of game of whether it's social media, whether it's business, you're going to be getting all the trophies, all the little social goods along the way. And then realize, wait a second, those are commonly agreed to social goods, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily good for me. That's not what powered me. And so all those wise where you're getting the likes and the followers and the badges and all those types of things, you'll look back and be like, that actually got me nothing. You failed through the successes. That's a fascinating statement. Mm. Yeah. And so, and that's okay. Right. Hmm. Um, more of the question is what matters now and how am I going to align my efforts to be closer to that? Um, and so that's where the, what do you want to do after <laughs> this is successful helps people start thinking like there's a now here that could be important, but there's something that follows that. What is that? Hmm. How's that going to look? What might that be for me? Um, and I just really hope people um, get out of the finite games of, well, after I make my million, then I'm going to make 10 million. And then after <laughs> yeah. I make 10 million, I'm going to make a hundred million. Like, okay, I got it. But what about after that? What is that doing for you? Why does mm. that matter? Mm. And you might find that so much of what matters might be available to you today wow. or sooner than you think. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to spend the next 10, 15 years of your life stacking a bunch of bricks to the thing that was right in front of you the whole time. You did a fail you to succeed your way to failure. That's it. I mean, wow. Again, it goes back to the Ferris Bueller quote, beautiful conversation, man. That's, that's fascinatingly profound. Huh? I love it, man. Thank you for sharing that. You've given me some, some food for thought and to make sure that we're not building something that is succeeding your way to failure. 
And you can see that by asking the question, what next after you've gotten and what next? And then it also has the side effect of giving you the practical looking back effect to see what you took to what you did to get there. So it's got, you know, the black and white, the past and future. You can look at both sides of it, which is interesting. So beautiful exercise. I love it, man. Dude, thank you for being here, brother. Anything else you want to add before we kick this off? No, I mean, thanks for having me today, Kyle. Um, so we, we've got that image, but I'm also going to be like, you know, find your pumpkin pie. Don't eat too much of it. <laughs> mm, mm. Maybe there's uh maybe there's something out there that we can aim for that it's impossible to eat too much of it. You know, uh, there's a, an infinite pumpkin pie out there that we can find the flavor and keep, keep mowing that thing down, baby. So interesting. Yeah, place the the world's traditions would say it's love and compassion. Mm. compassionate not polite true compassion mm. most deaf mm -hmm. has a beautiful lyric like that yeah comp compassionate not polite you know there's uh, there's something to that so the infinite love baby that's what i'm talking about dude charlie thank you for being here man and uh we'll keep in touch brother i appreciate you same thanks for having me my pleasure man bye for now all right. I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. And if you want to get a free copy of my book, go to kylesbook.com and you can get a copy there. I'll talk with you soon.